Uh, well, I think most of us realize that security and entrepreneurship go hand in hand. All the major players in the industry are venture backed. Mostly, those companies are too young to vote or drink, let alone screw with their customers. So if you're in security, at some point, you're going to work for a startup, or you're going to buy products from a startup, or you're going to invest in a startup, or you're going to acquire one. So you want to know what's going to happen to all these startups. Is there room for more of them? Which ones will succeed? Today, I'll discuss the long-term role of startups in the security ecosystem. But rather than speculate on the industry's future successes, because that's something I think that many of you are probably more capable to do than I am, or rather than hype my own investments, I think it's more instructive to highlight mistakes of the industry. Because unfortunately, security doctors don't swear a Hippocratic oath to do no harm. And so far, the results have been disastrous. <clears throat> so these are some of the questions that people ask me that I'll try to address today. So next question is, why, why dwell on the mistakes? Well, 10 years ago, Dan Farmer popularized the notion that we can't secure our networks if we don't openly air our vulnerabilities and errors. And just this week, Michael Lynn reminded us of the same thing. A lesson that I think not applies not only to information security, but also, I believe, to all challenging pursuits, including venture capital. <clears throat> And in case you think that I can only dish it out, but I can't take it in, you're welcome to take a look at the anti-portfolio that we at Bessemer publish on our website. It's the only one of its kind in the industry. You can read in gory detail, if you like, about the, frankly, stupid reasons why we passed on the first investment rounds in Intel, FedEx, Apple, eBay, Google, many others. Good lessons there for us. So this presentation is for uh, investors who don't want to lose their capital, entrepreneurs who want to navigate the landmines, engineers who don't want to make the wrong career choice, chief information security officers and their staff who don't want to buy the wrong product. Also, anyone with money in the bank who wants to keep it safe. And if that doesn't just about cover all of you, then I guess it's also for anybody who's looking to kill an hour between the two Fed presentations. So still, I expect that many of you came here looking for more positive direction on tomorrow's great inventions. I feel obliged to offer something inspirational here. So I've, I've injected into my presentation some, some interstitial slides here and there offering up some great examples of entrepreneurial innovation. You'll, you'll see them popping up now and then. Um, <clears throat> so I, I've told you, you know, about some things that Bessemer Venture Partners has done wrong. Please give me just 30 seconds to tell you some things we've done right in an effort, uh, perhaps, to lend some credibility to my ravings about the industry. So here's the, here's the background. As the oldest venture capital practice in the nation, Bessemer has for nearly a century invested the family fortune of Henry Phipps, a 19th century entrepreneur who decided to reinvest his proceeds from the sale of Carnegie Steel into other tiny startups like W.R. Grace and Ingersoll Rand. More recently, Bessemer has funded the early stages of Parametric, Staples, Siena, Cascade, VMX, Maxim, Veritas, Gartner Group, Perceptive Biosystems, and Skype. We have about 60 employees with offices in California, Massachusetts, New York, Bangalore, and Shanghai. We are the most active early stage venture firm in information security. You can see here we've invested in 17 security companies. Some of them are ones that I'm sure you know. Uh, some you may be less familiar with, but one thing that's in common is that we work early on with experts in the security field to start these companies. Folks like uh, Paul Macapetris at Nominum and Dan Farmer at Elemental, Bruce Schneier at Counterpain, uh, Mark Mayfrit at EI, uh, Gene Kim and Gene, Gene Spafford at 
at uh, Tripwire, uh, and of course uh, Ron Rivest uh, at VeriSign. Um, all but all but the recent three early stage investments that we've made here of the 17 uh, are all doing well. They all have run rates above 10 million dollars. Uh, five of them have gone public. One of them was acquired by Cisco, uh, and among the 17 investments we've made, there hasn't been a single realized or unrealized loss. Uh, the, we have a dedicated security team at the firm, uh, including, including myself, uh, Devesh Garg, who uh, ran Broadcom Security Business Unit, uh, Chini Krishnan, who founded Valacert, uh, Chris Risley, who was uh, CEO both of Nominum and previously of On Technology, which uh, after going public, Symantec acquired, and uh, just a broad, strong team of security professionals. Uh, and this team, we, we commit ourselves, we commit our time and our resources to maintaining a very uh, rich dialogue with chief information security officers in the industry. Uh, many of you are probably here and you know firsthand that we do this, and uh, we do that really to maintain a good pulse on the marketplace on behalf of our companies. <clears throat> easier to spread. Let's see. Okay, so uh, the biggest challenge for startups is that nobody wants to buy from startups. People want to buy products from big companies. They want to buy suites. And there are some very good reasons for this, uh, very valid reasons. Uh, product suites from big companies offer integration at the console level, they offer integration at the appliance level, making security easier to deploy in a scalable fashion. Um, these companies promise event correlation, and I think one day they might even deliver it. And, uh, and of course, they do, they do offer better vendor viability than what a, than what a startup can do. So I'm just going to run through some slides that show you the product footprint of the major companies in the industry. And you know, you can just, this is a taxonomy that, that we've developed internally to map out security products. Um, and the data for each company are probably about six months old. We last updated at the end of 2004. Um, but you can get a feel for how the different companies have, have, uh, have staked out their, their turf across the security landscape. Uh, here you have uh, Symantec and, of course, McAfee. Uh, here's ISS. And as you can see, the large vendors, they, you know, each of them offer suites that cover different aspects, more than point solutions, but, but still they, they can't cover the whole landscape. And so, um, and so what happens is that, you know, they really need to, enterprises really often pick one suite and then fill in all the holes around uh, the products that are offered by that, by that suite vendor. So um, this is a, an inventive cold remedy. <clears throat> so, uh, so then, you know, these, these big companies, they have these great suites and enterprises want to buy from them. So the question is why, you know, what, what are we smoking? We keep funding all these uh, startups out there to compete against them and have a hard time selling. And, you know, why do we do that? And, um, you know, here's, here's our thinking. Our thinking is that there are two major reasons why the startups have to exist and, and in the long run, as a group at least, have to thrive, uh, at least some of them. And the first reason is that there are constantly new protocols, applications, and platforms that are being deployed in the network. And every time a new one comes along, then enterprises have to completely rethink their security so that the security has to actually keep up with the new technology as quickly, it has to be the fastest changing element of the network because it has to move as quickly as everything else that's going on. And these are just some examples of protocols that enterprises are adopting now or have started to adopt last year. And every one of these things uh, introduces you know, important new vulnerabilities that, that change the way enterprises have to think about security. And then the second element is captured in this image here and that is that security is very different from other elements of infrastructure. Uh, and other types of infrastructure 
you're trying to basically, uh, it's, it's basically a battle of man versus nature. Uh, trying to iron out the wrinkles, trying to get the products to work better, and asymptotically these products approach perfection. Um, the way that, you know, in the way that routers and switches today basically work. They don't crash, we have enough bandwidth, they, they basically they work fine. Um, but security isn't like that because in security every time a company releases a product, you've got people who are, you've got many people who are actively trying to render it obsolete right away. Very creative and adaptive people. And you know, if that's not enough, more recently, the nature of that ad adaptation has changed now that uh, the enemy is motivated less by ego, mischief, and politics, and motivated more by profit. Profit from spamming, profit from extortion, profit from ID theft. The enemy now has the patience, the resolve, and the resources to continually escalate and continually adapt to the new products as they come out. And for this reason, we believe that it's absolutely imperative that uh, we continue to have startups, entrepreneurial teams, who are innovating new defenses uh, against attacks. Um, this is why I believe we've seen so much venture investment in startups. Uh, in the last two and a half years, we've counted, and we may not know all of them, but we've counted 477 distinct companies that have received venture funding during that time. Uh, obviously, these companies aren't all going to be successful, but uh, this, this level, the level of innovation that's coming out of these 477 companies absolutely eclipses anything that's going on among the larger companies. So um, that's, the, that's the role of the startup, and, that's the, and that's, the, that's the role that we try to fund. Now, with all these companies that are being funded, I'm sad to say that there aren't any public there aren't, there aren't any IPOs in the security industry since the beginning of 2003. So it's a lot of money going in and nothing really coming back to the hardworking employees and the not so hardworking investors in those companies. But what we do see is that, as we all know, mergers and acquisitions have really accelerated in the last couple of years, even beyond the, the peak of the bubble in terms of the number of deals and the number of dollars going to security companies. And that's because we have two, we have two types of companies in the ecosystem. We have the suite vendors who are great at integrating, integrated consoles, integrated appliance. They offer, that's their value to the enterprise. Then you have the small companies who are the innovators. They produce the new defenses. Usually they're point solutions, but these are the new defenses. In order for the integrators to remain competitive, they have to assimilate the innovative solutions. And so, and so although journalists like to talk about what's happened in the last year as a, as a consolidation in the industry, we don't view this as a phase of consolidation. We view this as a permanent fixture. This, this is going to persist. It's going to persist longer than the M&A string in the 90s, where Cisco 3 Common Lucent all acquired networking companies. Because again, those networking companies, eventually those products worked and they matured. But the best you can ever hope to do with a security product is tread water. No mess, no waste. So now let me start to talk about why it is that we see some major bloopers and blunders in the industry. And it starts off with an analysis of people's state of minds when they buy products. And um, so I'm going to talk about reasons why people buy security technology, why they pick one product or another. And the first reason, and this is one that I think we all agree is a very good reason, and one that a lot of attention is spent to here at DEF CON, I understand how this technology will likely secure important assets from entire classes of attack at a reasonable cost. And here we like to think that this is the only reason why people choose one security product over another. But wait, there are more reasons. Here's one. Lots of other people seem to think that this technology works. I guess that means I need it. This common, weak-minded disposition to suspend skepticism 
explains a lot of the problems in our world <laughs> beyond information security. Not only might others be wrong, and I'll point out some doozies today, but there simply is no one-size-fits-all security mix. Nonetheless, this kind of thinking does drive a lot of purchasing from the big security companies. Here's another brain malfunction that drives sales for Symantec and Cisco. If an attack brings our network down, I'll be okay so long as it brings everyone else's network down as well. So I'm just going to hide in the safety of the herd and buy whatever seems to be selling well, and never mind that we're seeing more targeted attacks today, or more importantly, that the consequences of an attack to my enterprise are pretty much the same regardless of whether it hits others. Okay, why else do we see people flocking to Symantec and Cisco? Well, I got a good deal on a bundle. I bought that big router or appliance over there, and the vendor threw in some cheap or maybe even some free licenses. It might not work, it might inconvenient my users, it might suck up IT resources, it might even be another vector of attack, but it was cheap. My favorite example of this cheap bundled nonsense is antivirus licenses for servers. You know, the computers that nobody ever uses for email or browsing, and the, the signature AV companies actually charge extra for putting their AV products on those servers. Let's see. Um, what's another reason? Oh, yes. Okay, we need to convince somebody. It might be our chief security officer or our chief information officer or our chief executive officer or maybe the board or our auditors or the regulators or our customers or maybe Congress. We have to convince somebody that we've got best practice security. Of course, best practices have been defined by somebody else. Those practices might imply working technology, but then again, they might not. Let's see. Here's one that, that startups can also exploit as well as big companies. A nasty attack crashed our network, and so I've got budget to deploy a defense. And you can always spot these folks because they don't want to hear about how the product works. They just want to run a battery of, of attacks against the product to see if it defends against them. And these are the attacks that they suffered uh, several months ago. And they seem, to have, they seem to suffer from this delusion that next quarter's attack is going to be exactly the same as last quarter's attack. And so as long as this product stops last quarter's attack, they somehow think that they're protected. I, I, I can't believe how often I see this in accounts. It's um, rather frustrating. And then finally, the last reason is that there's always relationship selling. You know, the uh, vendor threw a wild party, and so, uh, you know, I should buy the product. Okay, well, maybe that one's not such a bad reason. I'm going to move that up to the, to the plus category. Let's see. All right, so those are, we see a lot of poor reasons why people choose security technology that doesn't work. So now what I'd like to do is really explain what I mean by bloopers, blights, and blunders. And to do so, I'm first going to define uh, two distinct classes of security technology. There's, let's call it the security technology that works and the security technology that sells. Now, for those reasons we saw in the previous slide, these sets are not equivalent. Now, you know, my job at Bessemer is to find teams that have technology that works and fund them into companies that have technology that sells. And of course, that intersection is where all the great security companies thrive. But we also see a lot of security businesses with technology that doesn't work and technology that doesn't sell. And um, those all still get funded. And those are what I call bloopers. And I think, you know, blooper is a good name because it's sort of an innocent mistake. You know, maybe they blow about $100 million, $200 million of venture capital, but at least they didn't actually, at least didn't actually cost any customers any money because nobody ever bought it. Okay, then the next category of disaster, these are the blights on the industry. These are the technologies that don't work, but for one reason or another, everybody's buying them anyway. Right, and um, we'll talk about those. Now these cost the venture industry hundreds of millions of dollars uh, developing these products, but more importantly, they, cost, they can cost the industry a billion dollars a year buying these products, not to mention 
the costs that they incur trying to mop up the mess when the products don't actually work. And um, I'll talk about some of those. And then, and then uh, I'm going to spend actually more time on the third category because the third one is actually something that maybe we can do about, some, something we can do about. And those, oh, I'm sorry, one thing I should mention is that the blights inevitably, the good news is that the blights inevitably stop selling. Eventually people figure it out, but it takes a long time and a lot of money is wasted. Now the next category are the blunders. And the blunders, these are the ones that really scare me. These are the ones that the technology doesn't work, but these are hot products. These are the ones that everybody's talking about, and these are the ones that even some big companies are bringing into accounts, and everybody thinks are next year's products, and I would call them next year's blights. And I think we're gonna see them you know, on, on our landscape for quite some time, uh, because uh, there's a lot of momentum behind these technologies. My hope is that by illustrating some of these disasters and exposing the blights and blunders, I hope to assist you in avoiding the mistake of making a bad investment, a doomed career choice, a wasted product purchase, or even a dangerous choice of online bank. Uh, here's another invention, but this one might be a blooper. This is a mobile computing invention of some sort. Okay. So uh, I think I have to move a little quicker through these slides. Um, I'll start with the bloopers. Uh, so, you know, I think many of you may think this is wrong, and you know, I'm, I look forward to some hearty debate. But the first, the first, and these are, by the way, these are past. I think these are proven. I mean, these are these companies tried to make a go of it, and and they failed. First, they're the, they're startups who tried to build universal consoles, and of course, universal console is all about integration, not innovation. It's hard enough for the big companies to do it. It's almost, it's, it's really difficult for HP. It's impossible for a startup. And no start, and no enterprise is gonna buy a universal console from a startup. Um, another area is enterprise DRM. So there's been some great work done here. Companies like uh, Authentica and Alchemedia, which Finjan acquired. You know, they've built some great tools that allow you to mark documents and what can happen, and you can revoke the rights later. And it's really great technology. But what the industry has learned is that people just will not change their behavior in order to curb rights on a document further down. Um, Tumbleweed learned this, Slam Dunk Networks learned this, and, um, and now, you know, and, and, peop and more, more startups are continuing to learn this. Uh, and I think it's safe to bet that, you know, Microsoft is gonna provide good enough DRM in Office and, and that's gonna be the end of it. Uh, what happens is that enterprises, because the pain of an embarrassing leak is episodic and difficult to quantify in terms of damage, you know, this, this category of product never stays in the top three concerns very long. And if you're not in the top three, then, you know, you, you, you ought to go home and, and figure something else to do. So, um, next area is enterprise DDoS protection. Uh, it may be sorely needed, but the truth is that if you're trying to stop the traffic when it gets to the edge, it's too late. And you know the only way that the only way that DDoS is the only way you can protect yourself against DDoS is in the network. Uh, there are services you can buy, like the Prolexic service that Counterpain sells. But you know, Mazu and others they figured out that they need to do something different than than uh, DDoS protection at the edge. Um, again, these have all big big venture capital investments in all these categories. Uh, here's another one: PKI. Um, you know, benefits just never justify the expense. Sure, there are some, you know, applications like SSL, but in terms of trying to build applications on top of PKI yourself, uh, it just, just really doesn't, it's just really not worth it. And, you know, personally, I'm really pleased that VeriSign managed to buy network solutions and other businesses and diversify away from this. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, there's applet signing. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but basically, Applet signing is an example of just too much useless information. Uh, you know, other than the people in this tent, most people who look at the name on an applet have no idea whether that's someone they can trust or not. And so it really doesn't do any good. So uh, there, we've gone through the bloopers. Now the, now the blights. These are the ones that are still doing well on the market, still selling well. And uh, first there's IDS. And we all know the problems with IDS. They generate alerts. Every year they get improved, which means they generate more alerts and more alerts. 
and they generate so many alerts that speaking of too much useless information, that's what these things generate. And, you know, companies who use these are forced to either hire 24 by 7 teams of expensive experts to go through these or outsource them to companies like Counterpain or VeriSign to just to manage all the alerts that are coming out of these IDSs. Um, the second category is what I would call unmanaged firewalls. So, you know, managed and monitored firewalls, those are great. But what we've seen at Counterpain where they, where they manage and monitor hundreds of enterprise networks is that when they take over these networks, most of the, most of the firewalls, as you all know, are not configured. About half of them still have the default passwords in place. So, you know, half of the industry, half of the firewall industry is, uh, is wasted money. Um, and then, you know, there's my, my favorite peeve, the, the server-based signature AV, uh, because, you know, in case somebody comes along and wants to start doing email on your, on your WebSphere application server blade. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Now, on to the blunders. And I have really just sort of two, two, two slides on this. The first one is the, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot single sign-on. There's another blight. So single sign-on uh, sounds great. It seems like a really good idea. Um, but it turns out that it's really hard to integrate all your old apps and then keep all your new apps integrated and actually try to get the single sign-on to stay, to stay working. Um, I, I liken these things to the universal remote control that I, that I bought for my, you know, for my media system. Um, you know, it seemed like a good idea, but, you know, after a month or two, it ends up being just one more remote control on the table to worry about. Just too hard to keep programmed, right? So, um, now, by the way, there are some promising glimmers of innovation here in the area of web-based single sign-on, which seems to work a little better. Companies like Accentuate that are, um, that are making this a little easier, but I'm still very skeptical. So, now the blunders. So, the first one is the supposed successor to intrusion detection. And, and everybody said, okay, intrusion detection doesn't work. We need something that doesn't just generate alert. It can actually stop the attack in real time because it takes too long for the people to sort through the alerts. So intrusion prevention is the answer. And we saw a whole generation of these systems proliferate. And we even saw Cisco and Intercept, uh, Cisco and McAfee buy Okina and Intercept from some very, very lucky investors. Uh, and, bring, and they're bringing these things to market uh, with, with a lot of gusto. Um, the fundamental... Uh, the fundamental premise behind these products, which I find just laughable, is that every attack creates a visible anomaly, and every anomaly indicates that there's an attack going on. If you don't believe that that's true, then it's inevitable that anomaly-based intrusion prevention systems will cause false positives. And if they cause false positives, then you can be sure that the very first thing that's going to happen when some customer is blocked from a website is that that intrusion prevention system is going to be turned into monitor only mode, which means guess what? Now it's an IDS again, generating alerts for somebody to, to, to look through. Now there's some other problems with these things too that I mentioned. You know, they were, they're really slow because they have to look at all the traffic. They require weeks of training, so you can't deploy them right away. If anything changes on the server that you're watching, like the number of users or the applications or the configuration, then you have to retrain it. All in all, a very non-scalable solution. But the big killer is the fact that it has false positives. It just doesn't make sense for something that's supposed to be in line. Um, what's required here are intrusion prevention systems that have zero false positives. Uh, there are some on the market that use signature-based approaches. Those, of course, have zero false positives, but they don't provide zero-day uh, protection. Um, we believe this is a big area of opportunity. We funded a company called Determina that we believe has the solution to this space. Um, and, you know, I expect that there will be other com companies trying to uh, tackle this as well. Okay, now my favorite. So this one, this one is a set of technologies that I see coming strong into the market, raising lots of venture capital and getting a lot of money, mostly from banks, to deploy them. 
And, uh, and the damages from these, these blunders, I think, are going to be more costly than any others that we've seen. So I'm going to start, let me just start down the list. The first one is the desire of vendors, the, the belief that people have that somehow there's some client software that people can give you or some inbox software that people can give you that will prevent phishing at the inbox. A red, yellow, or green light that knows which sites are phishing and which ones aren't. Well, the bottom line is that software has no way of knowing what you think you're talking to. It doesn't know that you think you're talking to Citigroup. And, and so, you know, unless you're only going to browse on a whitelist, which nobody wants to do, these, these red, yellow, green lights are not going to work. They assume that fishers are not going to adapt, that they're not going to change their IP addresses, that they're not going to figure out ways to, they're not, they're not going to use zombies in the United States that have IP addresses that don't look like they're, you know, coming from Russia. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, these are quite naive defenses. Um, people sometimes think that they can apply rules to look at it and tell whether it's phishing. Well, the whole point of phishing is that it looks like a real email. It looks like a, it looks like a real, you know, site or a real email. There's just, you know, there's just no way to, for technology to be smarter than a human being in terms of seeing those patterns. Um, then there are simple mechanisms that, that vendors come out with that defeat very certain phishing mechanisms like URL masking. Again, these assume absolutely zero creativity or adaptation on the part of the fishers. Um, you know, they, they'll just do, you know, they'll just get URLs that look like they're real URLs. If I saw the URL citygrouponline.com, I have no idea if that's a real, if that's a valid URL or not. Um, and, and, and none of these phishing preventions, by the way, would stop you from new kinds of phishing attacks, like the bogus camera store that collects people's credit card information for selling cheap cameras, and the way they get the traffic is by buying the keyword on Google for camera. They get the top placement, and they get all this traffic coming, and people looking, oh, look at these cheap cameras, and then, of course, they use the, they, then they use the credit cards they steal to actually pay Google for the keyword. That's my favorite part of it. So, you know, we're looking at, um, oh, let me, okay, next one. There's this idea that we want to empower the user. Give the user more information. You're about to go to a non-SSL page. Your, this certificate's about to expire. Um, your, there's a license agreement that you should read and sign, and then you'll know what you're getting into. Uh, there's, you know, this is the person who signed this applet. This is the person who owns this domain. This is the person who's behind this email address. All these are attempts to give the user information and thereby empower the user to make decisions. The problem is, again, outside this tent, no one knows what to do with that information. Some window pops up and says their certificate expired or they're about to browse somewhere else. What do they do? They don't know what to do, so they just go browse. It's the, 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 the information becomes useless. Here's another, here's another last resort of the clueless. You see a lot of banks talking about this. The answer is educating the users. We just have to train people not to click on the bad stuff and that's going to solve the phishing problem or the ID theft. Well, how does, that, how does that solve farming where the DNS is, is, is redirecting your traffic? Or how does it solve malware that redirects your browser somewhere else or the bogus camera store? I mean, redirecting, you know, tra educating the users is, again, a very naive and really uh, negligent answer to, the, to, to protecting our bank accounts. Okay, here's another thing we see this is another attempt, hopefully, to stop phishing, is authenticating the email source, sender ID and, and DKIM and, and whatever, you know, the other standards wars here. Well, again, you're authenticating the source, but as we know, most of the people who register for those systems are actually spammers. So, you know, it, it doesn't really tell you anything about the behavior of the email. You might see some name behind the email source, but it doesn't give you any, any real good information. Okay, so what are the banks thinking? They're thinking, okay, we have to provide stronger authentication. Passwords aren't good enough. We have to authenticate everybody who comes to our site, and we're going to have to do it with, with real strong authentication. Well, everyone knows that there are trade-offs between security, convenience, and cost. And you can't apply the most inconvenient and the costly security to everybody who comes to your website. You have to profile. You have to be smart about it. If you've ever flown El Al Airlines, you know how they do it. They only inconvenience a few people, not everybody. 
this is going to be an unscalable solution. It's going to be too expensive. Here's another, here's another mistake. They're focusing all their authentication efforts on the login. The login is the least dangerous part of the session. What about the part where I withdraw cash or where I change my address? Those are the risky things, and it turns out that those are a very small number of sessions. If you focus the authentication on the risky transactions as opposed to the login, then again you have a much better way of focusing the security resources, the cost and the inconvenience on the, on the, on the sessions that matter. Banks think, okay, we're going to use strong authentication because passwords aren't good enough. We'll use smart cards like the secure ID card or time-based time -based codes. I'm going to loop the next three together. I'm, we're going to use biometrics, fingerprints to, to authenticate. Or we're going to use watermarks to educate the user so that they know that this is not, this is not uh, they know that this is a real site. Of course, if you're logging in from a new computer, then we have to ask you some challenging questions and we have to authenticate you and, and you know, we'll do that and then show you the watermark. Well, these last three, these are all really expensive. Not the last one so much, but those first two. Two-factor authentication has a total cost of ownership of $20 per user per year. That would be okay, maybe, if they worked. But all three of these defenses are all, are all uh, defeatable by either man-in-the-middle attacks, so all the fishers have to do is while they're collecting your data, your time code or your biometric information, they're turning around and logging into your bank at the same time. And they could do the same thing with the watermark, sit in between and get the watermark. Or they're also subject to malware-based slip streamers. So malware that sits on your computer and then waits for you to log in using all of this expensive technology and then just, you know, takes over your session, does something on your PC or hands it over to somebody else. So, and, you can, and those attacks are out there. They may not be very common, but you can be sure that when Bank of America deploys these defenses, that those attacks are going to become a lot more common. No reason why not. So, this is why I've stopped banking online. My money's not safe. Now, I feel like I want to give some prescription as to how I think this is going to get better. I think the landscape is going to be blighted for some time, but eventually what banks are going to learn to do is they're going to learn to authenticate the transaction, not the login. They're going to learn to profile the transaction, profile the user, profile the session. Where is this coming from? Is this an IP address we've seen before? Is this a normal thing for this customer to be doing? Um, is this just a dangerous transaction? Is this a change of address transaction which is dangerous or is this just somebody looking at his or her balances? Uh, and then, depending upon how dangerous it is, we're going to escalate the response. We're going to have costlier and costlier and more and more inconvenient security based upon the risk. With the penultimate authentication being not two-factor authentication, but multi-channel authentication. Because two-factor authentication doesn't work if the channel itself has been compromised, which is what malware does to a PC. Smart cards, biometrics, the, reason that's, the reasons they don't stop malware or slipstreaming is because the channel's been compromised. But if you do multi-channel authentication, then you, you defeat those, those mechanisms. Unless the, unless the attacker is able to compromise, identify the two simultaneous channels and, and, and compromise them, which is you know, many, many years out from now. <clears throat> uh, there actually, and I'll say there actually is there actually are a set of startups that are now starting to deliver this kind of technology, although I think it's going to be a while before banks recognize it. Uh, Authentify and Sciota have joined together to provide a service to banks so that they can do this for their online banking. A very cheap, scalable solution. Yeah. Okay. So, what, so the question is, what does it mean to authenticate the transaction? So. I'll just take the Authentify Sciota solution for a second and illustrate. Somebody comes to the bank and logs in. Just let him use a password. It's not the most secure thing in the world, but it's okay. Let him use the password. By the way, keep track of how many times it took them to get in. If it took them a long time because they had to do many passwords, that increases the risk, of course. Then, then see what are they doing in the bank account. If they're just looking at their balances, then maybe the password security is enough. But if they're trying to do something else, then you want to escalate the security. Maybe you want to ask them some challenge and response questions before they, before they look at their balances. 
Maybe they're doing something more dangerous, like changing their address, in which case you want to ask them more challenge and response questions. Maybe they're trying to actually move cash out of the account, at which point you say, okay, at, because this transaction is a risky transaction, we're going to give you a code, 3174. And now we're going to say, we know three telephone numbers that you've got on record, home, sell, and work. Which one do you want us to call? You don't say the number, you just identify which one. Your phone rings, for, uh, a computer calls you up and says, do you want to, do you want to, uh, uh, do you want to authorize the transfer of $50,000 to the Boys and Girls Club of, of Belfast? And then, you know, if so, enter the code on your, on your web session. And if you enter 3174, then that, that authenticates that very specific transaction. So you're authenticating the transaction. You're showing this is what I want, wanted you to do, rather than authenticating the session and then allowing somebody else to wreak havoc on the session. And it also limits the security focus to just the risky transactions. Does that answer the question? OK, so more advice, and this is for email providers. Um, restore credibility to email, not through domain authentication, but through behavior tracking. And I think this is going to be the domain of some interesting startups, like maybe Goodmail and Habeas, where they actually track the behavior of email senders and then use that reputational data in order to make judgments as to whether somebody is a, is a spammer or a fisher. Um, you know, there's a, the, the major, there's a bigger downside to spam and fish than the fact that, we, that our email is untrustworthy. And that's the fact that, that our trusted relationships, banks and e-commerce partners, can no longer use email to talk to us. Two years ago, if Citi, Citibank sent me a message, I would have responded. Of course, today, who would respond to a message from Citigroup or Fidelity on their email? Email is a lost cause. We have to somehow fix that. Question? Does behavior tracking step far beyond the boundaries of, of privacy? That's the question. Well, yes, just in the same way that questions at the airport uh, intrude upon your privacy for that as well. Um, you know, I think that people who want to send you email, like Citibank or Amazon, they're going to be okay with the idea that somebody's tracking their behavior. Um, you know, and there may be situations where it steps beyond the bounds, but, you know, if somebody, I don't think any, I, I can't imagine where a, where a company's going to have a problem if it's tracking phishing activity of somebody overseas and saying this is an IP address that you want to be careful about. Are there legal loopholes that, that weaken the, the business model? Yeah, well, there, it's possible. Those would have to be you know, litigated. Um, OK, uh, let's see. Last one, end user security tools. We have to get over this idea that the answer to security is to give the user more information and empower them. We have to start thinking about what we can do to help the user make judgment calls. Is this a license agreement you want to click on? Is this an email form that you want to put your email address in? Or is this going to generate a lot of spam? Is it OK to, to, to navigate to this site? We're going to see more and more, we're going to see companies coming out with warnings that help us make those decisions, that, that highlight links that are going to bring us to a site with malware on it, or warn us when we're going to do something that maybe we want to think twice about. That is much more useful in user security. Another idea. Okay, so, you know, we're always trying to think about where there are opportunities to, to make the security industry better. I can share with you, these are some of the questions that we ask ourselves these days about whether there are opportunities, and these are things I'd love to hear from people here at DEF CON about. Uh, questions like, you know, is it possible to build accurate and reputational services? Uh, for email, for IP addresses, for uh, ISP behavior, so that you know which ISPs are, are good internet citizens and which ones aren't. Um, do we, are there security vulnerabilities to RSS and Atom that require some kind of, uh, you know, security mechanisms? I don't, know, I don't know what those would be, but my guess is that there are, there are some vulnerabilities there. Um, and then one that I'm very concerned about, and that is VoIP on my, uh, spam on my VoIP phone. You know, spam on my inbox, that's sort of a hassle. 
But spam on my VoIP phone, I mean, that is just downright obnoxious because my phone is going to ring every time somebody wants to sell me something. And I can't apply Bayesian rule filters like I can with spam because you don't know what the message is until the phone rings. And so, you know, this is an area where I think, you know, there's room for some great reputational services or something to, to try to solve this problem. Um, I put here on the slide my coordinates for contact. Uh, you can hear me, you know, blather more in my blog at, at who has time for this blogspot.com where, where uh, I love to discuss, you know, blights and blunders. And so, um, so uh, please, please visit my blog. And then um, I'd like to close with a little anecdote. This, by the way, in case it's not clear, is an, is an indoor sundial. You see? Just kind of. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> that one's my favorite. Okay, so, so, uh, you know, so to a large extent, venture capitalists like me, we play a role in the ecosystem of being gatekeepers for capital as to which of these security projects are going to get funded. And so, you know, it's our job to try to spot these blunders before they happen. But we also need to appreciate the market that exists out there and all the innovation that's there. And, and so, you know, I, I am not cynical about the number of startups that are being funded. I, I think it's a good thing. And, you know, the, the, and what I want, and the story I wanted to tell you happened the Saturday night after I made my 12th security investment in a company called Sciota. Um, my, my wife, Natalie, she took me out to uh, the movies that Saturday night to see Born Supremacy. And um, we were going to this theater in Mountain View with a lot of uh, movie theaters in it. And, you know, thanks to Fandango, we righteously walked right past the long lines of teenagers. And we go into the lobby. And I'm trying to explain to Natalie why it is that these companies I'm investing in, they're not the same company over and over. Because she asked me, she says, why is it, it looks like you just keep investing in the same thing over and over again. You know, she looked, you know, she saw those same seven, 17 companies I put up on the page and when I tell her what they do, they all sound exactly the same to her. And she said, why do you do this? I'm trying to figure out how to explain to her why I keep doing this. Now in this, in this movie theater, in this movie theater, they implemented a security mechanism to prevent movie theft. Instead of collecting tickets at the front like they used to, well, they had a problem that people would go see a movie, then they'd come out in the lobby, then they'd go see another movie. So they moved the ticket collection out to the, the hallways coming off the lobby, and then after a movie, they usher everybody out to the lobby. So if you want to go back in, you, you need to give a ticket. No ticket, no movie. That's the security mechanism. So I thought, okay, there's got to be vulnerability here. So I said, watch this. I walked over to the front door. I waited for a little lull in the traffic. And then I um, preferred my handout and muttered as nonchalantly as I could, tickets, tickets. And, you know, a bevy of teenagers approached. And, you know, the first one gave me his ticket. That was the riskiest. But then the rest of them were cake. I mean, you know, they were jabbering on about football games and SAT prep. And meanwhile, their tickets were just accumulating in my hand, not looking at me. And it took them, you know, a good five minutes as they sort of wafted over to one of the ticket stands, and they got to the ticket stand, and then literally they spent another two minutes among them trying to figure out which one of them had the tickets, because they forgot that they gave me the tickets at the door. And then, by then, they figured out that they'd been fished, they turned around, and I was there, I returned, I returned their assets, and um, fortunately they didn't kick mine. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so, you know, my wife understood that security is hard. And uh, that's why I, like, like most of the people in this room, I imagine, really find it so intriguing. Um, <clears throat> as we, we should all keep in mind that as we craft new technologies, we're all going to make mistakes now and then. Um, but that's OK, so long as we critically assess our bloopers before they bloom into full-blown blunders. Thank you very much. I am. We have time for a question? No? One, one question. Yes? Uh, 
I mentioned, I didn't, I didn't say VeriSign was a blight. The question is, why did I mention VeriSign as a blight? Oh, why didn't I? Oh, uh, PKI is a blight. Um, there are certain aspects of PKI, by the way, like SSL that work great. I mean, SSL is terrific. SSL, you know, there wouldn't, a lot of e-commerce would have been stalled if it weren't for SSL. VeriSign, though, is in a lot of other businesses bes besides PKI. You know, they're in the registry business, they're in the wireless billing business, they're in a lot of business, and also in a lot of security businesses, a lot of outsourced security services. Um, so VeriSign does a lot of good things. I think PKI is just, was just a technology that was just, uh, you know, never justified it, justified the, uh, the, the hassle. Okay, thank you.